All right, so I got a question for you guys. You have an answer? All right, sweet. How many of you guys like lettuce? Lettuce? So Summer and I have kind of been on this lettuce kick where we've been kind of exploring different types of salads with romaine lettuce and spinach and all kinds of things, I'm trying to eat more healthy, mostly because I'm fat and I need to lose weight, and eating healthy is one way to do that. Um, but how many lettuce lovers we got? It, doesn't that look beautiful? Man, doesn't that just like make you want to sink your teeth in that lettuce and like rip off some of it? While although I've come to appreciate lettuce and actually enjoy eating salads, that I don't think is ever going to replace like a juicy steak that I can just sink my teeth into and rip apart and enjoy. Man, yeah, a steak is definitely better than that. Even better than that, bacon. Bacon, yeah, if I can get a, a strip of bacon and like tear it apart. Man, even better than that, bacon wrapped steak. Man, my mom used to make this flank steak that was wrapped in bacon with a pickle in the middle. Oh, so good. But, what? A pickle in the middle, yeah, pickle, yeah. It gave a good flavor. I don't like pickles, so I'd pull the pickle out, but it still gave a good flavor. So whether you like lettuce or not, lettuce is an important part to understanding Hebrews chapter 10, okay? So open up to Hebrews chapter 10 with me. We will see, before we get to there, lettuce is used in verse 22, 23, and 24. Let us. And it's a very important key aspect to understanding chapter 10. Don't you, you love what I did there? I've been hanging out with Michael Thomas too much. Yeah, sorry. All right. So, but before we get there, uh, this really kind of starts in verse 19. So Hebrews chapter 10, I think, is, is split up into two different sections. Uh, verses 1 through 18. And then in verse 19, the author of Hebrews starts transitioning and kind of transitions, I think, kind of through the rest of the letter here, the rest of the book. And so for the first nine and a half chapters, the author of Hebrews has really kind of been mostly giving us information and showing us through these different comparisons that Jesus is better and, and proving this point over and over again through different comparisons, through quoting different passages of Old Testament scripture. Um, and, but in verse 19, he kind of transitions to going from, here's information that's super important to what difference does it make? How does this apply to our lives? How does this impact how we live out our lives? And I think he starts off by giving us three, let us do these things. In light of this information, let us do this. But before we get there, let's do a quick recap of kind of the first 18 verses and look at that. So verse 19, let's start with verse 19. The very first word there is, therefore. And with therefore, we got to see what it's there for, okay? And with those next three verses, verses 19, 20, and 21, I think he's given a, a, a recap of uh, really all, the main points that he's made throughout chapter 9, uh, throughout the first nine and a half chapters. And um, it kind of begins, let's go back to the beginning of chapter 10, very first verse of chapter 10. I think let's start there to better understand uh, the summary that he's given. He says in verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 1, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come. Okay, I remember shadow. Uh, I think Amber, somebody mentioned uh, the idea of shadow that uh, was introduced to us in chapter 8. And I think the author of Hebrews is playing off um, uh, something that Plato said. Plato, a philosopher in the Greek times about I think he lived about 300 years before Christ came. Um, he introduced this idea, this philosophical idea, that we can only understand reality, only understand the world and the mysteries of the world uh, like a, a shadow being put on the wall. He, he kind of explained it this way with uh, a man in a cave who lights a fire, and the things he sees are reflections on the wall, the shadows dancing on the wall. And remember... Greek was very prominent during this time, uh, Greek influence. And so the people that he's writing to would have uh, very well known Plato, very well been influenced by the philosophy of Plato, and known this analogy that is being referenced here. 
Uh, that's the reason the whole New Testament is written in Greek, because Greek was the common language at that time, and the culture, the entire world was heavily influenced uh, by Greek understanding and Greek thought. And so he's referencing that there with the shadow. So he says, For the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Okay? So, main point. I think the main point that the author of Hebrews is really making through the whole first nine and a half chapters is this. And we got it up on the screen for you. This is the main point. If, if we had to summarize the whole first nine and a half chapters, it would be this. For the first time ever, Jesus serves as our high priest. And not just our high priest, but also our sacrifice. And not just our high priest and our sacrifice, but also our king. And he does so forever. Forever. If you've seen the Sandlot, you know what I'm referencing, but... All right, um, and that, I don't want us to, to glance over that because I think that's huge for us. Um, I don't want these just to be words that don't really hit and resonate with the core of who we are. I want you to realize that, that Jesus serves as our high priest, but also our sacrifice. Tana and Deer in our Sunday night Bible study, I think, kind of illustrated this well. It's almost like the high priest goes into the most holy of holies and instead of, of uh, sacrificing an animal, slitting the throat of an animal, he like stabs himself. That's kind of the picture that we have here of Jesus, is that he as high priest is going into the Holy of Holies and sacrificing himself. But he's also going as king. Never before in the history of the world has a king entered into the Holy of Holies. But that's the picture we get of Jesus. That's why this point is huge for us. And that's what he's communicating here in verse 1. And I think he also kind of hits on those ideas in verses 11 and 12. Switch over to verses 11 and 12 for us. Let me read that for us. He says, And every high priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Okay, so for year after year, ever since the, the law was introduced to the nation of Israel and, and Moses up on Mount Sinai, year after year, you would get this picture of, all right, I'm going to try to stay between the, uh, the monitors up here for, for Paul's sake. So uh, every, every year, um, you would get this picture of the priest getting the, the animal sacrifice from the people of Israel who would bring it, and he would take it in there and take it to the most holy, uh, the holy of holies, and sacrifice the animal. And then the next year, he would do the same thing, go and take the animal and take it to the most holy of holies to sacrifice and make atonement for the sins of the people. And year after year after year, this would take, and he would be standing doing this time and time again, uh, next year would come around, the Day of Atonement would come around, he'd receive the animal and walk over here, and he would stay standing the whole time and do this. And this is the picture that we have of the high priest that happens year after year after year. And I want us to notice here, in verse 11 and 12, he's drawn, the author is drawing a contrast here between the priest who stands daily and offers these sacrifices year after year, week after week. When the people bring the sacrifices, he stands and continues to offer these sacrifices. And he's talking about this priest who stands daily offer these sacrifices. He's contrasting that between the priest who sits for the first time. A priest sits in his service as the mediator between God and man. He sits in his offer of making atonement for the sins. Never before in history has this taken place. Has a priest ever sat in making a sacrifice, making atonement for the sins of the people? And that's what he's drawing here. Let's reread verse 11 and 12. And every priest stands 
daily at his service, offering repeatedly over and over and over again the same sacrifices year after year after year that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice, one sacrifice, he, for the first time in history, the priest, the high priest, our high priest, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we see here this picture, going back to the main point, the main point of the whole first nine and a half chapters. For the first time ever in the history of the world, Jesus serves as our high priest, as our sacrifice, and our king forever. He sits, for the first time, the high priest sits at the right hand of the throne of God, designating his rulership, his kingship over the rest of the world. That's huge. I don't want us to skip over that. So that's a, in my opinion, that's a, a, a the summary, a, a Caleb's summary of what the author of Hebrews is trying to communicate the whole first nine and a half chapters, okay? So that brings us to verse 19. So let's look at verse 19. Therefore, we've got a picture of what that therefore is there for, okay? So in light of all that, in light of that main point, therefore, brothers and sisters, Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, and here's where let us becomes important to understanding chapter 10, okay? Let us do three things. Let us first, you see here, draw near. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast in the next verse, verse 23. And the third one, let us consider. Let us draw near, let us hold fast, let us consider. Let's look at those a little more in depth, okay? Let us draw near. Verse 22, let's go ahead and read verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so how do we draw near? You might be thinking of, James 4, 8, uh, where he tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Um, I think that's a, that goes hand in hand with what the author is talking about here. But how, how do we draw near to God? According to the author of Hebrews, how do we draw near? With one, we draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We draw near to God in a true heart and full assurance of faith. Two, he gives us three different ways in, in how we can draw near. The second way is with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And the third way, with our bodies washed with pure water. Okay? So that is how we draw near into the presence of God. Is our heart right before God? Do we have a full assurance of faith and a pure heart as we come to draw near to God, as we seek after Him? Have our hearts been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience? Have our hearts been washed by the blood of Jesus? If that hasn't happened, we don't have the ability to draw near to God. We can only draw near to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Have our bodies been washed with pure water? Kind of using somewhat symbolism uh, in regards to um, uh, baptism and and the, the Lord's Supper here, with our bodies being washed with pure water and hearts being sprinkled clean. Um, have we been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Have we been immersed in the water, symbolizing our death, burial, and, and resurrection in Jesus Christ our Lord? That is how we draw near. So let us draw near. That's the first let us. Second one is what? Hold fast. Okay. Hold fast. We talked about this a good bit in our small group on Sunday night. Um, Mike Armstrong kind of uh, talked about how this is a nautical term here that I thought was, was interesting and, and gave some insight into holding fast. Um, in, in nautical terminology, it means uh, remain tightly secured, so, so wrapping onto something that is immovable, that's going to hold fast, that's not going to be swayed. Um, one of the a, a dictionary definition that we looked up is to continue to believe in or adhere to an idea or principle. I think the combination of those two ideas is is what the author of Hebrews is talking about here by holding fast. Let's read verse 23. Hold fast. Let us hold fast 
the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Okay? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. I love the way um, Sunday night Amber um, kind of equated it to the a solid rock that will not move. Are we holding fast to an immovable rock? Is our life anchored to something when, when life gets awful, when life sucks, when things can't get any worse, doesn't seem like it could get any worse? Are we anchored to, are we holding fast to an immovable rock? Have we built our life upon something that has a strong foundation and will not move? Life is going to get rough. For some of you, it might already have. It may, may be right now, might have in times past, but storms are going to be coming in our life. That has been true ever since sin came into the world. There's good times and there's bad times. You're either, uh, one pastor puts it, put it this way, you're either um, currently in a storm, you're or going into a storm, or you're coming out of the storm. Those are the three options in life. Um, coming into, uh, currently in, or going out of a storm. And so when those storms of life come, are you holding fast to an anchor, an immovable rock? Why? Why is that important? Why do we know that we can hold fast to Jesus as our rock? Because he who promised is faithful. There at the end of verse 23. He is faithful, and he has proven himself faithful all throughout history. Okay? So, let us first draw near, okay? Let us second hold fast. What's the third one? Let us consider. All right, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider. What should we consider? What is that? What is the thing that we should consider, that we should think about, that we should ponder? Yeah, let us consider, he tells us, how to stir up one another. Let us consider how to stir up our brothers and sisters in Christ. What are we supposed to stir them up to? Let us consider how to stir up one another to three things. Love, to, uh, two things, sorry. Love and good works. Love and good works. These two go hand in hand. Think of, of John 14, 15, where Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love is always demonstrated by action. And so if, uh, and that's what the author of Hebrews is talking about here, that uh, stir one another up to love that is accompanied by good works. These two go hand in hand. They can't be separated from each other. So how do we stir up one another? What does the author of Hebrews say? How do we stir up one another? Yeah. Sorry, did I cut you off? By not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. Why is this important? Why is it important for us to meet together? Couldn't you just, like, sit at home and watch um, some pastor online? Why is it important for us to meet together? Why is that vital? Why does the author of Hebrews, obviously they didn't have internet back then, so that, might, that, might, that was not an option, so maybe what the author of Hebrews is saying is Ill, irrelevant nowadays, because uh, we can just sit at home and watch TV. Is that the case? No. So why is it important for us to meet together? Yeah. Yeah, Gracie? Yeah, Amanda, you got something you want to add? Yeah, exactly. I think you guys are exactly right. And uh, the author of Hebrews talks about that too. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. This is where encouragement happens. When we meet together, this is how we encourage one another. This is how we spur one another on towards Christ. 
This is how I sharpen my brothers and sisters in Christ and how I become sharpened by them is through encouragement, through interaction with them, through them uh, showing me things that, that need to be improved in my life and encouraging me in the things that I'm doing well in. Uh, that's why it's vital for us to meet together. This is how we become a family. We don't become a family by sitting at home and watching a preacher, even if it's a fantastic preacher online. We become a family by uh, going together, by worshiping together, by uh, discussing the Word of God together, by sharpening one another and encouraging one another. That's what the author of Hebrews here is talking about. That's how we stir up one another. Okay? So let us draw near... Let us hold fast. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And that takes place within a family, within a community. That's why we stress being a youth family so much. And he kind of finishes off here that this should happen all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is a continual progression as we continue to see that day drawing near, what, what day is he talking about there? Yeah, when, when we meet Jesus, whether we go there or he comes here, that's our destination point. Um, one day, every single one of us is going to meet Jesus. It doesn't matter whether he comes here first or we go there. Our destination is meeting with Jesus. So whether that, uh, whichever one of those takes place first, as that day approaches, we should be doing this all the more. We should be gathering all the more as a youth family. We should be encouraging one another all the more um, as a youth family to love and good works. Okay? So the question is, and this is our challenge, are we continually growing in these three areas? Are we continually growing by drawing near, by holding fast to the anchor, to an immovable thing when life gets rough? Are we continuing to grow as we consider how to stir up our brothers and sisters to love and good works by becoming a youth family that is spurring each other on to Jesus? That's what sanctification is all about. That's a churchy word that I think everybody has probably heard before. That's what uh, he mentions it here in verses 10 and 14, this, this word uh, sanctification. And I think that is the mark of salvation to see continual progression in our lives, to see growth happening in these things, see ourselves growing as we continue to draw near, as we continue to hold fast, and as we continue to stir, uh, consider how to stir each other up. So my question to you is, is that true in your life? Are you doing those three, three things? Are you continually growing in those three areas of your life? Because I think that is how we determine one of the biggest questions I've been asked as a youth pastor um, is related to how do I know if I'm saved? So many students struggle with whether they are truly saved or not. And I imagine that's probably true for some of you as well. I struggled with that myself when I was your age. And I think the best way of really knowing that is do we see sanctification happening in our lives? Do we see growth happening? Can I look back on my life a few years ago and without doubt say that I am more in love with Jesus and I'm closer to Jesus now than I was a few years ago. This slow, gradual growth. Now, it doesn't happen. Everybody's got ups and downs. So I'm not saying that um, looking at yesterday is, is a good observation of that because some days are going to be better than others. But um, as you look back over the, the course of life, can you see a gradual growth over that time of falling more in love with Jesus and, and serving him more and surrendering more and more of your life over to him? Are we growing in these three areas? Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word and the opportunity to discuss chapter 10 together, Lord. We pray that you would help us to grow in these areas. Lord, let us draw near to you day after day after day. Let us consider how to stir one another up to good works, Lord. Let us not neglect meeting together. Lord, help us become 
more and more of a youth family. Lord, help us to ultimately fall more and more in love with you as we grow in our sanctification, as we grow in our love for you. Lord, we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, before you guys leave, uh, Luke needs some help carrying boxes. Many hands make light work. Luke is back there. He will give us direction and instruction on what boxes to grab and where to take it. So um, go back there and meet. You want to meet in the foyer? Cool.